Uh, so today we're going to look at Newton's method, which is a method for finding the root of a real valued function. Okay, so for us, a real valued function is going to be a function which takes real numbers as inputs and spits out real numbers as outputs. And we also want it to be twice differentiable, which means that the graph has no corners. And if you draw the graph of the derivative, that also has no corners. And if you draw the second, uh, the graph of the second derivative, you want that to be a continuous graph. You don't want any breaks in this graph. So given a real valued function f such that the second derivative of x, f exists and is continuous, uh, if this is too difficult for you to like think about, you can think of f as a polynomial or a function which involves trigonometric ratios and, and other polynomial parts. So this is an example of such a function, sin x minus x plus 1 divided by 2. Or think of your favorite, favorite high degree polynomial. We are going to look at a method to find the zeros of such a function. If f is a quadratic polynomial, then there's an easy formula that gives you the zeros, so the roots of f. You call it the quadratic formula. And it gives you either two real roots, or one real root, or two complex roots. OK. But if f is a higher degree polynomial, what do you do? Um, what if you are not able to factor it? Like, how are you going to find the roots? And what if f is something like this? How do you go about finding the roots? You want all of the points x such that sine x is, is equal to x plus 1 divided by 2. How do you even do this? So we are going to give an algorithm, which is not a finite time algorithm, but it's going to give you a sequence of numbers. The algorithm is going to output a sequence of infinitely many numbers, which get closer and closer to a point, to a real number, which is going to turn out to be a root of this particular function. We say that the mathematical way of saying that is that we are going to get a sequence of points which converge to a solution of f of x equal to 0, or which converge to a root of the function f. OK, so how does the algorithm go? So I've got a graph for f. So these are the input values. On the y-axis, we have the output values. Let's say that. Uh, my root is called some alpha. I have one. I have some root which is called alpha, and I start with some real number on the on the real line. So let's say I start with a point x zero or x naught. I'm going to say x naught on the real line. Now what I do is I draw the tangent to the graph at that input x naught. So I look at the point x naught comma f of x naught on the graph of this function. And I draw the tangent there. Now, if I'm lucky, my tangent will not be horizontal, and it will, it will cut the x-axis somewhere. So, if this happens, take the point on which it cuts the x-axis and name that x1. So, we started with an x0, and we got an x1. Now, do the same thing. Look at the tangent at the point x1, comma f of x1. So, this is this line. If that cuts the x-axis somewhere, name the point that cuts the x-axis at to be x2. So keep doing the same thing. At x2, draw the tangent and find out the point where that tangent cuts the x-axis, provided such a point exists. And so luckily, if none of these tangents are horizontal, you will get an x0, you will get an x1. You start with an x0, you get an x1, you get an x2, x3, x4, x5, and so on. So given any n, if you have an xn, if the tangent at xn is not horizontal, then you will get an xn plus 1. And the formula for finding this xn plus 1 is xn minus f of xn divided by f dash of xn. Now why this formula? This is how you find out the point on the tangent which is on the x-axis. The equation of the tangent at x0 is y minus, f, uh, y minus f of x0 is equal to f dash of x0 times x minus x0. Now, if you, you want to find the point where this line cuts the x-axis, so you set y equal to 0 here, and you solve for x. And this is precisely what you get when n is 0. And when n is any general number, you'll get xn plus 1 is equal to this. 
Okay, now you keep doing this. So from xn plus 1, you plug xn plus 1 into this formula to get xn plus 2 and so on. So you get an infinite, uh, infinite sequence of points. It turns out that the sequence of points will converge to some number alpha where alpha is a root of the function, where alpha is what we are looking for. If some nice things happen, if two conditions are satisfied by the initial guess x0 that we start with. So x0 is called the initial guess because we assume that x0 is going to lead to a sequence of points which give us a root at the end. Now what are the conditions? Now firstly you want x0 to be in an interval around the root where the derivative is never equal to 0. What does this mean? The derivative if you recall is the slope of this tangent of the derivative at x is the slope of the tangent line that we draw at the point x comma f of x to the graph. So what does this condition mean? It means that around my projected root or in some interval containing x0 which hopefully contains the root, my tangents can never have slope 0 or in other words my tangents can never be horizontal because we just saw that if for some xn the tangent is horizontal we will not be able to find out xn plus 1. Graphically, there is no point where the tangent will hit the x-axis and according to this formula, f dash of xn will be equal to 0, so xn plus 1 will be undefined. So, okay, now we need this condition to work out. And secondly, we have to make sure that we start with a point x0 which is actually sufficiently close to some root. Now this might seem like a circular condition. This might seem like uh, it makes the algorithm pointless. If you start with a point which is already close enough to the root, what is the point of the algorithm? Uh, but here's the problem. So we don't know what the root is. Given a formula for a function, we can always try to find out points where this function takes really small values. Like look at this formula, sin x minus x plus 1 over 2. I can try to find out points x where this whole thing is going to be less than 1 in absolute value. And I can do this by just manipulating this expression by using the fact that sin x is always less than 1 and so on. So I can find points where the function takes really small values, but to find out a root among all of the points where f takes small values is more difficult. What we are going to do is we are going to start with a point which is such that f takes a really small value at that point and we are going to hope that that point that we started with is actually close to some root and this works out because f is continuous. The actual condition here, the mathematical condition here actually depends on uh, some ratio involving the second derivative and the first derivative which I will not go into but let's just assume that we have a lucky initial guess and we want to get to the actual root. It turns out that uh, this particular method of finding xn plus 1 and x from xn by using this formula works if these two conditions are satisfied by the initial guess that you start with. So I'm going to give you an example where I find out the root of a polynomial, of a cubic polynomial when I do this. So here is a polynomial for which we do this. So I started with f of x is equal to x cube minus 5 I, and I want to find a root of this. Now a root of this would be a point where x cube is equal to 5. So in other words we are looking for a point which cubes to 5. We are looking for a cube root of 5. Now we know that such a number exists. We know that every real number has a cube root and we know that it has to be a positive number. Now I just graphed x cube minus 5 here. So I remember that 1 cube is 1 and 2 cube is 8. So the number which cubes to 5 must lie between 1 and 2. And looking at the graph, you'll see that it has to be closer to 1 than to 2. Okay, we have that. And I found the derivative of uh, f of x to be 3 times x squared. Okay, great. So now what I need to do is to pick an initial value, x0, to start with. So I need an initial value which satisfies the two conditions that we gave. So what were the two conditions? 
and in an interval around the initial value containing the root or in an interval around the root containing the initial value the derivatives must never vanish so i must look to avoid the one point where the derivative is vanishing so i need an interval around alpha where the derivative is not vanishing so i can take any interval which does not reach zero and start with an initial value zero, with an initial value there and the second condition is that without knowing alpha somehow i have to make sure that x not or x zero is close to alpha this is where the information about the function helps so i know that alpha is between 1 and 2 i know that alpha is somewhat close closer to 1 than to 2 so let me just pick 1 as the initial value as an educated guess i know that 1 cube is 1 so the 2 cube is 8 so alpha must be somewhere in between and towards one side so i pick 1 so let x not be equal to 1 So now I have to apply the algorithm. So using x not, I find x one just by using the formula x n minus f of x n divided by f dash of x n. And from x one, I find x two. From x two, I find x three, and so on. I did up to six steps here. So you can see that the values are firstly decreasing for a while. In fact, they are decreasing, and they're getting closer and closer together. The difference between x one and x two is roughly point five. The difference between x two and x three is only point one, and the difference between x three and x four is not even that. And then keeps getting smaller and smaller. Now after x six, x seven, x eight, etc., all seem to center around one point seven zero nine. Oh, the exact value that they center around is about like one point seven zero nine nine five, and it stays stable there. If you take large values of n, x hundred, x one hundred one, etc., etc., all turn out to be really, really close to this number. And so, you can make the guess that the root is approximated by this number. I've not written down the whole number here. It's going to be a number with a really large decimal expansion. And it turns out that um, the cube root of five is actually really, really close to this. The cube root of five is approximately one point. Seven zero nine nine. The cube root of five is an irrational number. We'll get only rational values here, but um, we get a close enough approximation. So the Newton method works to give you a cube root of five. Okay, so let's see more about this. So that takes care of one root. But I can also look at x cube minus five as a polynomial that takes in complex number inputs and gives a complex number outputs. In which case, it has three roots. And the question is, can we find all three roots using the Newton method? So if you know that the other two roots are both either both real or complex conjugates, now five has only one real cubic root, so the other two must be complex numbers. So now the question is, where do I start on the Newton's method? If I start with a real number and keep applying this formula, x n minus f of x n divided by f prime of x n over and over again, I still get real numbers. If x zero is a real number, x one is a real number, x two is a real number, and so on and so forth. So if a complex number is my root, I can never approximate it by just real numbers because real numbers can approximate real numbers only on the real line. So I can't do that. Here's another example where the same thing happens. F of z is z squared plus one. We know where the what the roots are, plus i and minus i. But the same problem arises. If we start with a real number, then we cannot end up with a complex number by iterating this formula over and over again. But it turns out that for any for this polynomial, z cube minus pi or x cube minus pi, the Newton's method does work. Um. If you start with a suitable complex number, there is a region of the complex plane which is everything in the complex plane minus some region which has zero area. We say it has zero area. If you look at the plane and if you just look at the line, the real line on the plane, then the real line has zero area. So for this polynomial, there is a region on the complex plane uh, which covers almost all the area. So instead, if you pick a point on this region and apply the this this formula over and over again to that point, then you do reach a root. And the same thing happens for z square plus one. Now the question can be, 
given a region on the complex plane, sans something which has zero area, I'm given a degree D polynomial. So let's fix a degree D and let's fix a region on the complex plane, which is almost the entire complex plane, minus the real numbers maybe and other parts. Can we apply this formula over and over again to that point that we start with in the given region such that we reach a root eventually? So this is a question that people posed. So we fix D and we ask, can we, for any given polynomial of degree D, can we find, does this method work if we just fix a region on the complex plane out of which we are allowed to pick initial values? And the answer is yes, for D is equal to 2. When F is a complex polynomial, you can, uh, when F is a quadratic polynomial, you can do this. The answer is no for degree, three great, uh, degree D greater than or equal to 3. A mathematician called Kurt McMullen proved that for degree 3 polynomials, this formula does not work, but another formula does. So what are we doing here in this algorithm? We start with a degree D polynomial f of z, and we look at this function given by z minus f of z divided by f dash of z, which is a rational function, right? We can take this to the numerator and write this as polynomial divided by polynomial. So to this degree D polynomial, we are, we are assigning a rational function. And to find the root of this polynomial, we are taking some initial value and we are applying this rational function over and over again to that initial value and hoping that it converges to a root. McMullen showed that for degree D polynomials, this rational function does not work, but some other rational function, which depends on f, in particular the coefficients of f, does work. And he also showed that if degree is greater than or equal to 4, then no assignment of rational functions can give you an algorithm that actually works. And this field of study is included in this subject called dynamics in one complex variable. What we are studying in all of this is the long term behavior of functions like this, of rational functions. And this is what the subject does. It studies the long-term behavior of rational functions, which take in one complex variable and gives out com one complex variable. And the long-term behavior can be used to answer questions like this. This is just one particular question that we answer. Uh, if you are more interested in this subject, uh, there is this book um, which you can read after you have taken an introductory, introductory complex analysis course in college or at the high school level. Uh, it's a book by John Milner. Uh, please look it up if you are interested in this method. Okay, um, thank you. I hope this was interesting.